So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, this is our November uh, Lunch and Learn, um, Driving Digital Business Innovation with Low-Code Platforms. Um, with us today is uh, ICS graduate Mike Josephson. He graduated in 2007. Um, first off, I just wanted to thank, uh, thank everyone that was able to make it to um, last week's uh, Networking social. If you're able to make it to Tustin, um, uh, over to the um, uh, to the restaurant we had our networking social last week, it was um, it was great to see you. If you weren't able to make it, um, then you know we'll we'll definitely. I think we're we're really excited about uh, uh, continuing to deliver in person events like that. So you'll definitely catch. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to catch the next one. Um, but that was really fun. Um, this. Lunch and Learn is probably going to be our last event for this calendar year, just given the holidays and everything. I think we're all just, you know, um, uh, uh, we just want to make sure that we, you know, all attend to our our day to day and our families and stuff. And so we'll come back in the new year nice and recharged. Um, just a reminder, um, icsanteaters.org is our main uh, is our website and the main place where you can get sort of the information to all of the different social channels that we've got out there, uh, as well as uh, videos for this Lunch and Learn. Um, also, uh, also on the website, uh, we have um, uh, a web, uh, a page that has a listing of the various committees uh, that we are um, forming and uh, trying to get uh, filled out. Uh, so if anything, interest you as far as wanting to uh, volunteer your time, like all of us uh, on the board, um, would love to hear from you. Um, and uh, yeah, take a look at the committee's page to see if there's anything out there um, that is interesting. Um, also uh, out there is our calendar. So uh, that should be up to date. It's sort of a shared Google calendar. So as we uh, uh, have events planned out, uh, you'll be able to find uh, those events on the calendar. Um, so kicking off today's Lunch and Learn, again, um, driving digital business innovation with low-code platforms. Um, I think the recency, and that maybe it's not so, um, low-code platforms is not necessarily a, a new topic, but I think that with the developer shortage that we've, you know, our industry sort of experienced um, and a, a desire for upskilling uh, knowledge workers to get them to be um, uh, included in the technology creation process and the innovation process, I thought it might be uh, a good a good topic to talk about. So super excited to have uh, Mike Josephson with us. Uh, Mike is a developer turned architect and low code evangelist who is passionate about providing creative and innovative solutions for his clients. As a manager of solution architecture, he is responsible for working with his team to analyze business challenges and to help to transform the way development is done. Um, when he's not working, you'll find Mike trying to figure out where to find, to, <laughs> to catch waves. Uh, we've, we just got done talking about the fact that it's, he's maybe a little bit further from the ocean as he used to be, uh, riding his bike or listening to his latest audiobook. Um, Mike, what, what audiobook do you have uh, on deck currently? I'm currently going through the Harry Bosch series from Michael Connolly. So I'm on hmm. book, uh, book eight now. So kind of going through all of them. Gotcha. Gotcha. Very good. Very good. Well, Mike, thank you uh, for joining us. I'll go ahead and um, stop sharing. So you can go ahead and uh, go ahead and share and, and kick us off. All right. So pull up. There we are. All right, so what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about low code, um, about the industry itself, some of the tangential industries, um, where I, I see a low code being applicable with a wide amount of uh, different customers. Uh, and then I'll kind of give you a peek into what is what is low code actually look like? Um, and what does that mean? So. Um, that said, let me jump right into it. Uh, 
questions are definitely welcome. I want to make this interactive. I don't want to um, just be preaching at you. I want to kind of want to hear your feedback, hear your thoughts, and and um, kind of help to uh, address any questions you may have. So Gartner's actually done a lot of analysis with relation to low code and uh, some of the tangential spaces. Uh, I'll, I'll delve into that later, um, but they really see this as a, a pivotal way in which uh, many companies are gonna be doing software development moving forward. Um, and there's a variety of different reasons why. Um, really, the, with low code, you have a lot of flexibility in terms of speed to, to deliver applications, to get to market quickly, um, the agility in which you're able to adapt the applications to the different dynamics of the customers themselves. Um, business, businesses change, needs change, and uh, having something that's flexible to those changes is, is critically important. Um, also, the ability to, to do more with the resources. Uh, a lot of times you can deliver applications six to 10 times faster as compared to traditional development. So uh, you're really saving a lot of, of development effort with relation to that and getting to market quicker. Um, time is money uh, and being kind of the first to the field uh, really helps a lot and can be a strong differentiator to you uh, organizationally. When you look at it, uh, just to get a perspective of the space, there's actually two different um, uh, quadrants I'm gonna show you here uh, where OutSystems, my company, um, specifically, you'll notice we're kind of up top right, but there, there's a lot of different companies in the space. So you have a lot of big name uh, software companies, things like Salesforce, SAP, um, some lesser known ones like uh, Mendex, uh, but still that's actually been acquired by Siemens now, um, you got Pega. So you've got a lot of different uh, companies in, in the space. Um, we're also looking at enterprise low code application uh, platforms. There are slight differentiations here. I'm not going to go too much into it, but basically think about it um, being um, the ability to deliver enterprise-grade applications or also deliver to a variety of different devices and formats. So mobility, that type of thing, small differentiation between the, the two, but you'll, you'll notice that a lot of big name uh, brands in here. You got Microsoft, ServiceNow, um, these are multi-billion dollar companies. So a lot of companies are investing in it uh, because there's a lot of, of money behind it. Just to give you a perspective too of, of how Forrester takes a look at it, you'll see a lot of the same names here. Um, you got Microsoft Mendex, ServiceNow. It's always in flux. There's about 240 different vendors in the space. So that's, a, that's an incredible amount of, of companies. Um, and th there's a lot of reasons why. Um, that said, uh, when you actually look at it, what, what is low code, like where, where are we? as it compares to some of the other industries out there, right? So low code, we already kind of talked about it, Microsoft OutSystems, Mendex. But we also go up against COT solutions because being low code, you can effectively deliver a variety of different types of applications. Could be things like, these are just ones that I, I was thinking of, customers that I've worked with that have done things like order management applications, customer management applications, data management applications, marketing, budget applications. So, for all of these different types of, of applications, there's off the shelf products that meet customers' needs. A lot of times though, those products only get about 80% of the way and they have to do some customizations in order to get at the remainder. Um, and that's where you, you really notice um, customers will say, hey, we'll use low code instead of a cost solution because we can get a little bit more tailored to my end needs. Um, traditional development, we come up against all of the time, all the time, like more common than any other development, uh, more common than any other vendor, any other commercial off the shelf, anything else, it's going to be traditional development. A lot of companies have invested years building out proficiency centers of excellence on it. Um, and they like what they're doing and, and they don't want to, uh, they don't want to change regardless of whether there's uh, benefits to them organizationally to do that. So, um, those, those are ones we come up, uh, and then also we have tangential industries. A lot of people hear about RPA or, or BPM. Um, there's a lot of overlap between what you can do with low code with what you can do with RPA or, or BPM. We have a whole workflow layer, for instance, in, in OutSystems. Not every vendor though in, in the low code space would have kind of a full flavored BPM engine. So there, there is overlap, but there's differentiation and there's, there's ways that you can work well together. I would say for any enterprise scale customer that I work with, so like thinking of like a T-Mobile 
uh, Ryzen, you know, any of the, these big, big companies, they're going to probably already have an RPA engine. They're probably are going to already going to have a BPM engine. They're looking kind of the best in breed. Let me choose the best. What's the quickest time, time to value here. And they use those tools. So it's really common for us to work in conjunction to some of these, these other vendors as well. So Mike, that on that, that COTS, the, the, yep. that column there, that's, that, those are basically like like fixed point, like not necessarily point solutions, but just very specific use case applications, right? That yeah. are just sort of like fixed and not like customized, right? Totally. So for the marketing, I'll, I'll give you a, an actual practical example. I was brought into a large entertainment company in, in Los Angeles. Um, they said, hey, we've got uh, a legacy marketing system that's created, it's a COT solution, uh, created like uh, initialized, started 20 years ago, right? At that point, you didn't have Google, you didn't have, Facebook. Sure. So they had to kind of bolt on, on top of it to kind of make it work in a kind of Frankenstein type manner. And they're like, mm. you know what, this isn't working for us. It's not scaling anymore. We need to, to redo this. And so that what they evaluated is say, oh, we're going to look at other low code vendors. We're also going to look at the latest version of this vendor's software and see if it, it meets their specific needs. So it's really common for us to be kind of viewed as what's the time to deliver, right? Because in the end, you're basically being compared to, you're building from scratch for the most part. You do have accelerators and ways to speed it up and it's six to 10 times faster than traditional development. So you're you're building really quickly, mm -hmm. um, but you're getting compared to what would be the time that it would take for the customer to basically um, put, put that in there to build that out if they were using a COT solution. Um, so, so fundamentally, um, that's one of the things that we're, we're really being evaluated against. Gotcha. Um, and so, so like, what is the benefit where, where do, why are customers doing this? It's like, you, you really look at the industry disruption that's taking place right now. And it's pretty substantial. You see it kind of in a perspective of, uh, as uh, an example here, Blockbuster, right? Um, Blockbuster got completely uh, its business model got completely destroyed because you had kind of Netflix come in and, and basically say, we're going to digitize this, right? All, all the industries that I'm seeing are, are being disrupted by technology. And um, low code is a way to be that digital disruption for so many of these specific customers. When I go to my customers, what are, what are the problems that they're having? Like this is across every customer that I have and it's across industries, it's across all shapes and sizes, small startups to large, you know, behemoth fortune 10 companies all have these, these problems of mm -hmm. backlogs. They've got application needs. They've got ideas that they need to get to market, but they just don't have the ability to deliver it. They have tough um, non-functional requirements. They have regulations that are coming in or changing and, and they need to really adapt to meet these needs. Um, so how, is it that a platform such as OutSystems, oops, or any of uh, the other uh, potential vendors out there? What, what, are the, what are some of the use cases that we handle? Now, when it comes to low code, it, it highly um, varies a little bit as to what are the proficiencies of, of certain companies. So OutSystems has a broad range. You go to Microsoft, they're gonna have a, a set of this. You're gonna go to Salesforce, they're gonna have a set of this. You have Mendex, you're gonna have a set of this. So everyone varies a little bit in terms of what is their proficiency and types of applications that can be built on the platform. OutSystems has the greatest depth, but there are specialties where, you know, um, Salesforce does a great job building on top of their platform. A lot of customers already have Salesforce. So they say, I need to build some applications on top of it. Salesforce has a, a low code platform that, that does that. They're really good at that. So um, these are, these are common types of applications? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So gotcha. just to dig into that, double click on it, um, customer experience transformation. I think that is like a B2B application, B2C application, something that would be deployed to a app store, Google, um, Apple, or uh, like a portal in terms of accessing information pertaining to that company. So something that, that requires a high level UI or high quality UI, because ultimately it's, it's out there, everybody's gonna be using it. It's, it's about your brand. It's about the experiences that you're providing to your, to your customers. Um, then you've got workplace innovation type applications. And this is really around departmental type applications or uh, improvements in, the in relation to the employee experiences itself. 
Um, sometimes what I'll see is you've got data um, broken into maybe three or four different systems and you need to find a way to centralize a view onto a single application to really uh, make the experience for that employee optimal. Um, that's a great example of what you could do. You know, pull in that data, uh, create a single pane of glass. Um, process optimization is, it's about optimizing workflows, um, simplifying processes, removing paper. Paper is still so much, so commonly in companies. Uh, approval processes, you go to a big company, they've got six layers of approvals that need to take place. Having ways to, to simplify that make it um, mobile enabled, um, reduces time to, to get business value. Um, and then application modernization is, as the example that I mentioned earlier, where you have a, a legacy system or, or a legacy technology. Like um, I see a lot of times customers are, have mission critical apps on say VB6. And you're like, oh man, I don't, can't believe you're still using this technology. You're, you're running $20 million of, of business here what are you thinking? Like that, that app could break, you know, it's held together with scotch tape. Um, and I, and I've seen that, um, at, at a lot of companies. And so it's about, let's get rid of some of this legacy debt. Uh, and let's, let's replatform it really, really quickly, um, onto, to another platform. And, and that's a really common uh, use case. I'm going to take a quick step back, see if there's any questions on anything that I mentioned thus far. Nope. All right, let me continue. On. I was just going to make a comment, man. I, I really love BB6, by the way. That was, that was one of my favorite <laughs> environments. Uh, you would. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, this is a really, this is why so many companies are investing in low code. Like you look at these numbers here, 20, 2020 had about 13 billion in revenue in low code um, platforms. 2025, it's projected to be 45 billion. It's like the the ability to address such a large set of use create use cases and being industry agnostic creates a huge TAM. Um, and you know, I, I see this kind of, and I've seen it hyper growth in my my own company. We've been growing anywhere between 30 and 60 percent year over year, and so are the other um, companies in in the industry because it's just people need it. The, the status quo isn't working. Um, and low code is a way to kind of break up that status quo, to, quo a little bit. Hey, Mike, you said 45 billion. Did you say TAM? Yeah, total addressable market. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, thanks. Yep. 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 Yeah, actually, that's part, part of the reason I came to working at, at OutSystems because um, one of the things I had wished I had known earlier in my career was thinking about like, What's the, what's the size and the scope of the industry that I'm going into? Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of straight out of college, I was like, I want a job, you know, I want to make money. And then kind of like, as your career pro progresses, you start to realize there's, you know, kind of hyper growth areas. Um, and this was one of those hyper growth areas that really excited me. Plus, I like building out applications and I like solving business problems. And you get a kind of the ability to do all of this and really quickly. And you see your, the ability to, um, get something done quickly, mm -hmm. um, it's really impressive and keeps me excited. Just to well, give you a pers mm -hmm. Sorry, real quick, I, on, that, on that point, I think it's really interesting, especially given our, our audience maybe here, but also our uh, audience that may be watching this in the future. I mean, I think that when you look at the ICS major and the school of ICS and just sort of like, historically, it's been all about software development. But I think that in, in, in recent years and, and even like since we graduated, it's, it's become more, more than just programming, but all the various uh, um, sort of adjacent um, uh, disciplines for computing. So for those that aren't like hardcore developers, this might be a tool set that's very, very relevant, right? And yeah. so it's like, you know, it's, it's sort of, it bridges that gap. And, and as, one thing I'd like you to think about, and, and you don't necessarily need to answer it now, but at least wh where I see low code fitting in to a developer, kind of in your classic developer uh, 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 type of person, is where you have almost like it's a it's like a complement where you've got, and Microsoft actually mentioned this in their recent uh, in their recent um, Ignite. Uh, conference where they're talking about professional de professional developers and 
and I really dislike this term, the citizen developer, right? It's sort of like you've got you've got folks that are are maybe business uh, uh, subject matter experts that can create um, applications and functionality, but you've also got the professional developers that have a very big role in creating the applications that it's not so much like low code takes away everything that a professional developer is going to do. It's, it's a give and take, right? Where originally it was all professional developers, but now it's this sort of like complement. And so at least that's where, where I see it. Um, do you have, do you have a similar, similar kind of perspective on that? Yeah. You know, Companies have a wide variety of skill sets and a wide variety of technical proficiencies for the people that work there. Um, and with a platform like a like a low code platform, you have it opens up different opportunities and it lowers the barrier to entry to building applications. I, mm -hmm. The way that I kind of look at it and I position it when customers ask me about it is, you know, I. I think of it as the, the platform kind of adapts to the technical level of the individual. If you're a hardcore developer, you'll do great in a low code platform. You just, what you end up doing is you're, you're the ones that are like developing, getting voice transcription to work in the application, you know, within the first weekend, like then you have those that are, you know, business analysts or, you know, more on the business side and they're not as interested in the technology, but they just want to get something up functional and mm -hmm. you can, throw spreadsheets in there and you can build out a couple of screens. Um, and it also allows for different specializations if, if you want people to be more focused in on workflow or UI or, you know, just kind of um, simplifying the architecture or having the conversations with the business. You, you, you have a lot of ways you can you can kind of change the skill sets up to kind of adapt to the, the technical level of the people that you're working with to get the most value from them. And a lot of big organizations want that because they've got a huge set of, of people that they want to kind of get the most value from. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Um, I, I think too, one of the really um, powerful parts about the platform is it's just being industry agnostic. I, I kind of threw up here just a uh, you know, NASCAR slide of a bunch of different companies that OutSystems work with. I, I guarantee you, Mendex, Microsoft, Pega all have similar slides of really big name companies. Um, and, it, and it spans all shapes and sizes, right? Um, I've worked with startups. I think low code is, honestly, if I were starting a company, it's it's really the only way that I would choose to, to develop an application um, to, to large scale, you know, Fortune Fortune 10 companies. They, they just have such complex um, problems uh, that they, they need something to, to help them deliver fast. Um, and I just, again, what excites me about this, this market uh, is that, uh, it's huge. Um, there's and it's it's untouched, right? When you're growing at um, the market rates we are, which is you know 50 percent year over year in the billions of revenue side, um, it just opens up opportunities for for newcomers um, and um, uh, potentially uh, career opportunities. Hey, Mike, real quick, there's a question from uh, Vartan. Oh, um, perfect. Isn't low code just another name for modular development? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. Um, low code is a is a way that they. It's kind of an encapsulation of the visual uh, drag and drop type development where you're not in the lines of code. Although it will depend on the low code vendor that you specifically work with. Some are more heavy code. Um, some are lighter code. But it's it's really about that the taking the development up later. You're not really writing lines of code, it's it's more about what what is the business requirements that that you're actually developing. Now, from a perspective of modularization, um, it, it also varies by local vendor. Some, some do this better than others. Um, I'll actually give you a little peek into how that works in OutSystems. It's a highly modular uh, platform uh, and it it's uh, that makes it extremely powerful because you can basically segment layers into things like I want to have a, um, I want to have uh, like an integration layer, and I want to use that integration layer across multiple different applications. Um, that's that's the type of power that you have in the platform. But not all not all low code platforms um, have that that kind of modularized architecture. Um, some do, I think, especially in the top right, you get a little bit a little bit better there. Um, but but some aren't either. Like Microsoft actually is 
actually has four different products that make up its, its suite. It's got an RPA engine. It's got a workflow engine. It's got um, it's the power apps, which everybody's aware of. And then it's got its data layer with CDS. So, you know, it's, it kind of all depends on, on the low code vendor a little bit, but I, I, that's the way I kind of look at that. Gotcha. Fully, fully finished products. Um, we do have prototypes. It's a great for, um, uh, that, so the question being is, is low code more intended for prototypes or fully finished products? A lot of people think of low code as cookie cutter um, and prototype. Uh, and it fits well into um, rapid development teams um, within organizations. But honestly, um, you know, I, I've now worked at, at OutSystems and seen us ad address such complex use cases that I, I really st truly believe that you can build out large, large scale complex applications with, with uh, low code platforms. Again, that will vary by low code vendor. Uh, no code cannot build complex uh, applications. Low code, it would depend on the vendor in terms of how deep they can they can actually go in into that. But um, you can build really really nice, really deep deep applications. I think one one thing that's interesting on that topic too, I, and you you talked about it a little bit. And you kind of you you hit the non functional requirements. Right, you talked about those non-functional. That it was several slides back, but there was a slide about it's 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 hard to implement uh, uh, some you know complex non-functional requirements like yep. security, scalability, you know, um, all those various uh, various things that, that I think that's kind of that's one key differentiator that depending on how strong the platform is in those areas. Is going to is going to really speak about its enterprise readiness, right? So it's like you can build something quick, but if you if if you don't have like the appropriate level of security, then it's not really production ready, right? So yeah. I think that's especially now in in the cloud enabled, you know, uh, <laughs> cyber you know uh, cybersecurity, you know, with a heightened uh, uh, sensitivity around that. I think that's going to be super important. For sure, I, th I think you touch on a really good point too, which is around governance. Um, governance is so critically important. Knowing that you're building something and it's not going to create more technical debt, right? That it's going to be created in a secure and scalable manner. That's a that's such a critically important factor on in relation to any COE, but but especially when you can build something quick, you can build something bad quick. You can build something that's not properly structured quick, right? So so having ways to to understand that, uh, that's so, so important. When I see a, a company like, like, let's say T-Mobile, where they went from zero apps to 61 apps in nine months, um, that was, that's a journey. Um, and it's, you're adapting processes, you're changing organizationally to, to handle that because it's, you know, it's, you're, you're actually, you're, you're having to figure out how do you onboard these applications? How do you distill these requirements? How do you pass these off to development teams? How many development teams that you have? So you're kind of organizationally changing. It actually changes the dynamics of, of development a little bit because now you're, you're, you're kind of pushing on the organization to kind of change and adapt because you're able to do so much so quickly. Um, I think T-Mobile is a, why I wanted to share this particular use case because I wanted to really show the size and scale and speed in which you could do um, things like uh, building 61 apps, um, re-platforming off a completely different platform in, in under nine months is, is a heavy lift. But if you're you're interested in it and you're committed to it organizationally, you can do an incredible amount um, in a very short time. And that's that's how you get that strong uh, competitive di differentiation. Because if you're doing that through traditional development, 61 apps in nine, nine months would be kind of a heavy lift. You know, if you have enough developers, you could you could you could do it, but you know, that that's uh, mm -hmm. takes a lot. Um, so I wanted to I want to kind of bring this back to the idea of okay, this is great. It's wonderful for me to kind of say this to you that we can do all these things. But like, how do how is it that we we fundamentally get it? So this part I'm going to kind of more focus in on on how out systems handles it, so you get a better. So I can kind of take you a layer deeper when you're looking at a low code platform. Um, and then I'll show you how low code works kind of visually that drag and drop nature of it. So you can get a perspective of, of that. So you can kind of put at the, the macro level and then the micro level. Um, so out systems, when, it, when I'm looking at it, when I'm, when I'm pitching it to my customers, I'm saying, you know, 
It's about building applications quickly, building them in a safe, secure manner. It's governed that can ultimately adapt to changing business dynamics. I think COVID was a great example of where you have rapid change coming to an organization and you have to have things like uh, a COVID app application for um, people that are entering a work site. That's a use case that came up at one of my, one of my customers locally. Um, they're like, well, we, we need to handle this. Perfect, we can spin up an application in a couple of days, right? Um, how we've effectively built the platform is we've, we've kind of segmented it into four key layers, that data layer, that process layer, workflow layer, that logic layer, and that UI layer. For each of these layers, basically have a set of visual drag and drop components. Um, that's what makes it so easy and less time consuming to develop, but it also adds a layer of reusability and modularization to it. Um, but that's drag and drop oriented and intelligent learning from the individuals that have built applications on the platform. Every customer is a little bit different, regardless of who I speak to, whether it's a small startup to a, a large Fortune 10, they have a different set of systems. They have different business requirements and the platform needs to be flexible to integrate with it. So there's a variety of different ways we do it. Things like direct database integration for like SQL and Oracle, or, hey, we've got um, 4,000 different open source items that can be downloaded and incorporated rapidly into the application. So we just make it flexible and easy. And that's something that you will, you'll see um, different uh, proficiencies with, with the other vendors out there as well. Um, we also uh, accelerate the entirety of the development lifecycle. So it's not just about building an application quickly, it's about being able to deploy it quickly, being able to migrate it quickly. So by centralizing all of those different elements that make up the development lifecycle into a single platform, it really allows you to be more agile. So you can update, meet new business requirements, and you can get to market really quickly. Um, all the while, we are able to provide experiences that are expected. Experiences evolve as new technologies become available. Um, and so as things like chatbox, Alexa integration, wearables, as each of these different technologies become more prevalent and more accepted within a business, OutSystems basically adapts the platform and adds these functionalities in so that now you can incorporate this. But it's not in a manner that like you don't, you, you have to kind of make huge changes to everything you've built. It's just saying, hey, we're, we just enabled new functionality. So you now can, you can now interact with this with the individuals that are um, using the applications that you built on the platform. So that adaptability um, helps a lot. And it allows you to be more current from a technology standpoint so that if you're in the entertainment company that I mentioned where at the time they had envisioned development, they, they weren't, they, they didn't have the idea of Facebook and Google. Well, you know what, 10 years from now, I guarantee you there's gonna be new engagement means that we didn't think of now, but the beauty of a, a, a evolving platform is that it will factor that in, it will incorporate it in so you can get the best of breed in there. I like to, I really like this slide in particular because it, it gives you a good encapsulation of a lot of the, the things that are of value to the organizations that use a low code platform. Full stack, right? Breaking that development into those four key layers. I'll actually show that so you can get a better perspective of what that means. Ease of integration and extension, so important. I mean, you have a whole, market that's built up around integrations, right? You've got MuleSofts, um, you've got Workados, um, which we work uh, really well with. Um, so you, again, and most company of scale will, will have one of those, but um, we also make it easy to incorporate pre-built components. Um, being full life cycle, simplifying development. I, I know back from my services days, I used to put so many hours into the migration process simplifying that onto a platform just it makes life so much easier. I'm not copying files from one system to the next. I'm just having the platform deal with it all for me. Um, reduces errors too. Um, does things like dependency checks, the things that could otherwise be held not um, would be difficult if I didn't have the proper uh, technology to support. And um, one of the really important pieces of the platform is having a really high quality UI. Uh, it helps with adoption. Honestly, people want to use applications that look good. They do. If it looks crappy, if it's hard to use, um, it's less inefficient. It's more inefficient, and it's uh, you're less productive. Um, so having high quality 
experiences is, is critically important, all the while having the fundamental basis, the foundation of um, scalability, uh, security, uh, performance, and, and being able to deploy to um, wherever the customer needs, whether that's in the OutSystems cloud, whether that's in um, a um, private data center like a AWS. Um, another area of differentiation for the different vendors, some, some are cloud only, some have the ability to, to be hybrid, um, some uh, such as us, like let you actually de deploy into your own private data centers if you want. Um, kind of just depends a little bit across the industry, but that gives you a good uh, 10,000 foot view. So uh, any questions before I jump into a quick demo of the platform? All right. Yeah. Hey, we're good. Oh, Jeff? Cool. Yeah. John? How does performance compare? So if we're running this thing up in the cloud, we're paying you know, per clock cycle, per IO, how does it compare to more traditional? So this will depend on the low code vendor that you choose. Um, there are different way, there's different kind of fundamental approaches that some of the vendors have taken. Out, out systems actually compiles down to native code. So we're, okay. we're highly per performant and in, um, you could say on the same level as traditional development. Okay. Um, that's what gives us the scalability of it. Other vendors actually go through an intermediary layer. So it's kind of translated on the fly and they tend to have problems at higher scales uh, when, we, when you start factoring in. Cause like some application use cases you get are like um, hundreds of thousands of internal users which is a lot of concurrent access or um, millions of external users in the case of like, I've got a city services app. Um, that, that's where uh, some of the other vendors start to struggle because they just can't meet the same scalability needs. Um, but so it, it kind of depends a little bit, but, but how we've worked it is we, we compile down the native code. All right, I'll tell you where to send the check later. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Any other questions? Cool. All right. So this is Service Studio. This is really where the core of the development takes place. We augment it as well with some um, uh, for lack of a better world, word, I'm going to say citizen development tooling. Um, <laughs> I totally, but, uh, I didn't mean, I, didn't mean I, was to, to, I was trying to think, I was trying to think about how, how I was like really... to put that, right? Um, but, it, but, but I, but, but it, it's really, um, for instance, right? We have a, an experience builder. It's about rapid UI prototyping. It's not about building out really complex applications. Um, we have a workflow builder, which is about be, being able to develop your, your workflows and all of that can kind of push it into here. Um, but it's basically harnessing the, the um, experience set of the people that are most interested in those applications. Um, and here, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna build an application from scratch. I do have the ability to build, uh, there's a couple of pre-existing applications. You'll notice a lot of like templating type things within the platform. Um, this is an example of, of there's like six different apps that I can choose from. Uh, OutSystems in general is a pretty feedback oriented company. So we like to hear what are common use cases and then we'll build those commonalities into the platform itself. I'm gonna build a reactive application. I could build a mobile application. I have a lot of flexibility there. Um, application, select my color profile. And um, I'm brought to a modularization layer. So we're, the question earlier about like modularization with the platform, this is one of the really powerful parts of it. Um, in fact, this is this is actually one of the topics that most people don't understand when they first start using out systems. It's basically uh, how you can build out highly modular, or highly scalable applications. And this is this is part of how we can address really complex use cases. Because what, what ends up happening if you start analyzing complex use cases is you realize these big applications, these monolithic applications can be broken into smaller parts. By having it modularized, you can have different um, delivery cycles for it. So I could have a, a, a team that's focused in on one module of the application, and maybe it's my UI. Maybe I wanna update my UI on a weekly basis, right? But at the same time, I have some core systems that I need to integrate with. So I have like a integration layer that I need to go to, let's say SAP. Um, but because of the criticality of that, um, and the impact of that, I may only want to deliver that every three weeks, but by having a modularized architecture like this, it allows the flexibility to have different delivery cycles, which also allows you to maximize your development time, 
uh, minimize overlap. And there's actually architectural uh, and governance best, best practices that OutSystems has re related to that. Um, but it's a really powerful part of the platform. I, I love um, I love uh, people that are interested in that modularization because I think it's so so important. And you get where you get so much scalability in the end. Hey, Mike, have you seen mm -hmm. it, with your customers that like, and I think the governance part is, is huge, right? Because you could have a modularization, but where where you have let's say a team that's that's responsible for like a, a piece of shared code and then they just go and like break interfaces kind of repeatedly and then just like whoever's dependent on it they 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 get broken um you know kind of without warning is yeah that, is that something that that ha might happen frequently in like local platforms on specifically in out systems but just like in general as a it's as a it's a risk. It, now, OutSystems has best practices to um, avoid these problems. Um, so there, there are ways that you can mitigate it if you follow the architecture best practices. Um, but I, but I, yeah, I've definitely seen that where if you, you don't really know what you're doing, you're having like one module that's referring to this other one, which is referring to this other one, and they're kind of working like this. So you've got this cycles and stuff like this. So you, you don't want to have cycles in certain layers. You don't want to have upward references because it can break things. So it's like, there's ways that you can mitigate that. And we actually have a, like a, what we call is our architecture dashboard, which basically allows you to visually represent, oh, here's where some of the problems are, but that is totally a problem. And that's a problem in other low code platforms. And it's like, it, like anything, um, takes a little bit of thought uh, to understand um, how you want to structure something. What's the best way to put it together? Uh, a lot of people think, you know, um, the idea is like low code means you can just pick it up in, in a day. Um, I mean, honestly, that's not true. You can't pick up a programming language in a day. Why would you expect that you can pick up an application in a day? You can't pick up Photoshop in a day. You know, like you're, you're talking about something that can build out complex applications. You, you, you do need a little time to understand it. It's not going to take you like years of study, like it may take for traditional development, but um, it does take a little bit of practice to understand the pieces together. Um, how they fit together and, and the way to structure it. You know, I, I still learn new things every day without systems. And I'm sure it's like that with, with any other platform. Great questions. I'm just gonna pull in some data here. Um, how this works is uh, OutSystems basically just analyzing the data structure in here. I have a couple of different tabs in my um, Excel file. Um, and what I'm gonna use is I'm gonna use that as a means to um, kind of um, build out some uh, screens around it. The, the data is pertaining to a customer. So really what I'm gonna do here is provide some context on the customer. Um, visually, the number of customers that I have, maybe the ability to update it, maybe to see where they're located, have some feedback on the customer. Uh, as a quick 10,000 foot view of the platform, you notice on the left-hand side, I've got my contextual low-code widgets. On the right, I've got that development broken into those four key areas, like I mentioned. Um, so that the workflow, um, the ability to build out those high quality U UIs, um, the ability to create logic and reusable logic, which can also be shared cross application, very powerful part, uh, ability to integrate with a variety of different systems, whether that's REST or SOAP-based web services, or we can actually build out integrations through our integration builder, which just simplifies the integration process, makes it a little easier to understand more, more visual. Um, and then I've got my data structures that I'm using in my application itself. Um, by dragging and dropping in that data structure onto my uh, low code canvas here, um, it's actually able to use an accelerator to build out a couple of screens for me. That's a overview screen, basically information related to my customers, as well as a, a detail screen um, where I could actually update some details related to that customer. So things that it, the platform's doing here, is it's using the data structures to dynamically update the screens, right? So this is reflective of the underlying data structure that I've got here. It's actually built in save logic here. So kind of all of those things um, just help to speed up the, uh, the development process. Um, and uh, it, they're, they're, the screens are already interconnected. So as an example here, I've got my customer uh, screen. If I click on this, I can. Uh, it'll actually navigate to that customer. It's smart enough to know whether I'm creating a new customer or updating an existing customer. Um, then I've I've hit the one-click publish button here, which basically says I'm going to take this application. I'm going to 
compile it down to uh, optimized code. I'm going to update the database. So in the sense that I've created new data structures here, and then I'm going to deploy it across all my front end servers. So the idea being there, it's just simplifying the whole deployment process, making it easy, um, leveraging the platform for it. And here, let me pull up that screen. I got a second screen here. Um, you'll see it's deployed now. It's got the uh, username and password because it, it's sitting on top of the identity management. So whether you're using Okta, OAuth, SAML, platform supports all of those things just to simplify that process. Every, every customer has a different identity management system. And frankly, a com company of scale probably has two or three. So they're always looking for uh, ease of, of use with relation to that. You'll see here, the data has been pulled in from that Excel spreadsheet, has things like pagination there, or if I wanted to do a kind of inline searching kind of built in there. So I don't, I don't have to figure out what are all the logistics for putting those pieces together. Although I could change it if I wanted to, which is a powerful part of the platform, that ability to change um, based on feedbacks is really helpful. And um, coming from, uh, I used to do water waterfall development and uh, going to an agile development, I just, I can't believe I ever did waterfall because you spend months doing needs analysis and then agile, it's like business person comes in, plays around with the app, says, can you make these three changes? You're like, okay, no problem. And you see this more tailored fit the purpose application that better meets the needs of the, of the customer and the business is happier. I always remember with waterfall, it's like, we kind of, you know, square uh, round peg square hole, you know, it just, mm -hmm. sometimes it works, but it, it doesn't always. So it, it's, um, I think it's really powerful that being able to build quickly and, and change quickly. Mike, you, have, you bring up a good point as far as like waterfall and, and agile when, when you see folks and you see customers adopting a low code platform, how much of the sort of like, not, not even just a, from a technical perspective, but from a business operations perspective, how much change needs to happen for a business to like adapt into like, now you've got this tool that's like, you can build stuff really fast. Is it something that like, it almost seems like, like the, the business has to also become more adaptable and become more agile in and of itself? Totally. It, it, what's, what's interesting about it is that for, for uh, what it does is it kind of changes the, the changes around the dynamics a little bit. Whereas, you know, you hear so often it's like business is waiting for the IT to mm -hmm. do something, right? But now IT is waiting for the business to give updated requirements. And it, it actually changes the onus onto the business a little bit. And the business has to be really adaptable and really responsive because now you're able to make these changes really quickly. Um, it's, it's very interesting to see the dynamics. Like there's usually a progression that I see with most customers. Mm -hmm. Most will start kind of in a, it's a kind of a crawl, walk, run approach, right? Where first year you're gonna see one to three applications. On average, some customers do 61 like T-Mobile, right? But that's that's not every customer, right? That's very rare. Um, second year, you're starting to scale up. And that's where you start to really organizationally have to think about how you're going to structure a center of excellence, right? Like, who do I want to have in this? Who do I want to have as my you know owner of this platform? Where do I want to run it? Like, how do I want to move these things together? Um, and and that's, that's where it starts to, you, you start to see the challenges and you start to have to think about how you want to re rethink um, business. And then once you start to scale up to that kind of full digital factory where you're churning out dozens, if not hundreds of applications per year, that's where you're really, you've really built out a proficiency and specialization. Because at that point, it's like, you're going to have your UI specialists because they, they know how to make things look for people. You're going to have your, your data ninjas, you're going to have the the people that are building out your your integration layers, and you're going to have a you're going to have a much more specialized you know organization. Um, but it takes it takes a while to get to that that full digital factory. Um, most most people aren't there yet. Again, low code really took on. I I, I saw a real uptick um, in interest about five years ago. So you have some customers that have really like we have customers that are twenty years with us, right? We're we're a twenty year old company. Um, but very few have, have really bridged that gap to be full, full factory. Um, mm -hmm. But when you are, it's amazing. I mean, the, the level of, of um, ROI you get out of that is just, it's incredible. 
Very cool. Uh, I, I did want to do a time check. We are about 10 minutes, uh, right at 10 minutes away from, uh, from the top of the hour. Um, uh, just wanted to make sure if from a demo perspective, as far as content goes, was there anything else you wanted to, to show? I'll show one more thing. I could go as long as we want, but I'll show one more thing. Uh, and I'll make a quick change here so you can see that. Let's say I want to pull in something else. Let's say for my customer detail here, I'd like to kind of visually represent where that, that customer is located. So again, back to that modularization of the platform, right? I have a set of um, pre-existing components that um, are available on the OutSystems Forge that basically extend the platform. This is where over time, new I ideas become available, new functionality, new new needs, new things, the new the new things that people want to see in their applications come up, right? Um, and you can add them in rapidly into the application. So as an example, if I wanted to pull Google Maps into my app right here, I can just select this. It says I'm going to add a couple new widgets to my map, to my uh, low code. Uh, canvas. So you see here, I've got two new widgets. This is kind of the extensibility over time. And I can um, drag and drop this in here. And then I'll, I'll have a set of configuration associated to it. A lot of the development and out systems is basically tying pieces together, right? For a map, what I want to do is I want to specify an address here. Now, where we have AI and ML built into the platform, you're going to notice there's predictions throughout it. So when I'm doing my canvas development, when I, you'll see recommendations. What am I trying to do? The platform's intelligent and it's learning. It's got kind of neural learning actually going on here and it's kind of constantly improving um, the recommendations and whatnot that it gives you. Um, and then I can deploy it. And that's it. Like, that's pretty awesome. I don't know, need to know anything about the Google Maps API, how those pieces work together. I just need to know, I've got an address that I want to display. And this is probably the address that I want, which is exactly the address that I want. Um, and then I've already deployed it, right? It's already been deployed, that new version. Got another thing built into the platform is you've got that uh, built-in versioning. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go ahead and update my app here. Click on a customer. John, is. Is, that, is that a diehard reference? <laughs> I, I am sure that it is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Cool. So it shows you how easy it is to do stuff like that. That's that's one of the, honestly that's one of the things that got me excited about um, working at Out Systems is because I I kind of like nerded out on building apps and then I was mm -hmm. like I can build an app really quickly this is awesome I see a question here uh, yeah do you have any experience with or can you speak at all to ensuring regulatory compliance or maybe building low code with compliance in mind from the get go Oh yeah, that's uh, hugely important for a couple of our key verticals. So thinking of like healthcare, um, so OutSystems is HIPAA compliant. Um, also, we have compliance with relation to ISO 27001. There's a whole level of certifications that we have when it comes to um, companies uh, in insurance, um, financial space. Um, we, we have a variety of different certifications and attestations that um, meet the needs from those cu customers from a security um, standpoint. Uh, in, in addition, just to, to talk a little bit about the space, it varies uh, quite dramatically depending um, on which low code vendor you're speaking to, which um, certifications they have and how they support specific verticals. Um, but HIPAA came to my mind because that's a, that's a common request from the healthcare space. Um, and uh, the OutSystems Cloud um, is uh, you can be uh, is HIPAA compliant, so you can you can build HIPAA compliant applications with the platform. Cool. Any other questions? Probably got time for for another one. If anybody, I have a question. One. Sure. So in your demo, you kind of showed a lot of like automating front end development, but I'm wondering how low code works when automating back end, especially a server that has to deal with a lot of requests simultaneously. Yeah, so um, that comes down to the workflow layer here. So you have the ability to build out processes and they meet all kind of the common activities, anything from something that would require some type of human action to something that you would kind of automate, like, hey, I've got a REST service or I want to grab data from a variety of different systems or I want to set up a, a timer so that this runs at certain times. And then you have the ability to break down complex um, data sets into something that's more manageable. Um, but that's really managed through the process layer and that logic layer where you can have 
actions running on the server. That's what that that's equivalent of the server action here, um, or even on the device. In the case you've got a mobile device, uh, really common for disconnected field services type applications that they need um, stuff like that. Um, but that that tends to be how you can you can handle complex workloads. Like for instance, uh, FICO uses us for for a lot of the workflow uh, loan originate loan origination systems, and so effectively. Um, they're they're building out complex workflows, reusable, reusable elements, and and using out systems as, as a core uh, management of that. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the the um, the pricing? Seems to be oriented to uh, big companies pay, and everyone else is free, or they um, discourage small business. No, um, you know, I'll be frank, I, I would say that probably up till about six months ago, um, we were kind of more focused in on enterprise sales. Um, but now there actually is a couple of really good options. If you're kind of a small startup, um, we do have some ways that you could um, basically leverage the, the platform at an affordable level. We have two different ways. It could be user based, um, or it can actually be application object based, which is more or less Kind of the the complexities that make up an application um and so you actually have some flexibility there um and it's it's very uh very, actually very affordable um entry level if you want to kind of dabble your foot in the water see if if you like it furthermore we also have a free version of the platform available um outsystems.com try now for free top right corner um and you can you can actually play around with it build out um full applications in it um, so you can get a sense for it. So we try to, we actually try to make the, the barrier to entry fairly low. So um, customers of all shapes and sizes, regardless of, you know, whether they're startup to a large multinational corporation can, can um, get value from the platform. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Cool. Probably have time for one last question. See if anybody else had any other one. No. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks for the time right. today. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Can I sneak sharing. one in? Yeah, go for it. Um, how do you deal with decommissioning services and out systems? So let's say you offer a SOAP API, but you know, five years from now, who uses SOAP anymore? So how do you deal with your customers that rely on that? Yeah, so generally speaking, um, with parts of the platform, uh, let's say I decrement some functionality in it, we're gonna support it for a few years more um, while there are ways to transition out of it. Um, so, you know, that's been my experience. Um, we went through a major architectural change about, you know, three years ago and I we still have support for the functionality that's there. And then there are best practices in terms of migration. So it's common from a perspective of like APIs to move from one API to the next. Um, you know, there's ways um, and best practices around how to how to handle that. So there tends to be what we'll do is we'll kind of work work with our our customers to to help to understand um, any impacts that they have and and give recommendations as it pertains to that. All right. Uh, well, can your system yes. handle the ETL process like <clears throat> Informatica? Um, can you do the transformation? We, we do have some customers that are, are doing that, right? Um, again, being general purpose, that isn't necessarily um, what every single customer is doing, but I do have customers that have that specifically do applications around that. I think it just comes down to what your business requirements are. Generally, it tends to be a out systems can, can handle those use cases. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? Well, Mike, thank you so much for sharing uh, sharing all this knowledge, and, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, again, uh, follow us uh, on the various socials. Uh, we've got um, uh, all of our all of our uh, content uh, will be um, uh, this recording will be posted on icsanteaters.org. Again, if you uh, uh, can check out the site, see if there's anything from a uh, as far as committees that you might be interested in volunteering for. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. I think that we also have a uh, just a, a sort of a general like sign up uh, so that we've got you know your 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 um, uh, sort of like your interest uh, interest uh, in volunteering in general. Uh, like I think there's a, just a, a join 
uh, form that you can fill out so that we can um, we can reach out to you as well. Um, but thanks again, and thank you so much uh, for spending your lunch time with us if you are here on uh, Pacific time. Otherwise, everyone have a great weekend and um, happy new year next time we see you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, all. Great to see you, MJ. <laughs> great to see you as well. <laughs>